call the uh, meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee to order. Uh, first order of business is the minutes. Um, do I have any comments or corrections? Make sure you check that you were in attendance. Uh, Daryl. Um, if you go down about three quarters of the way down, um, there's a sentence that begins that the housing allowance is not considered a permanent part of the person's recompense. Uh, okay. The housing allowance, is that what you said? Yes. Okay, what, what's the... Okay, I suggest we change the word recompense to compensation. Yeah, sorry, I haven't found it yet. Uh, what, did, what words does the line start with? Uh, the line starts with the word recompense. Oh, okay. Ah, there it is. Housing allowance is not considered a permanent part <clears throat> of the position's compensation. Okay. Okay, any other corrections? Bill? Uh, yeah, just to show that I was present uh, on the night, please. Ah, okay. Will do. Anybody else? Charlie? Yeah, I have a question on the reserve fund. Did we vote to take the 500K snow and ice deficit away? <clears throat> uh, I don't think we specifically voted that, no. I think that was the intent, but I don't think we actually voted that. And of course, we don't vote the uh, 500,000. We can't vote it, but vote be the, how, how can I change that? Uh, voted, with why the, don't we just say? The, how about with the understanding that? Okay. You could say voted the 1,465 snow and, uh, reserve fund with the understanding that the 500,000 snow and ice deficit would be eliminated. Yeah, so who was the understanding with? Well, I think that uh, we only voted to go to 1,465, but I think uh, uh, with that, we don't, we don't need the larger reserve fund plus the 465. Uh, I that would be the way to balance it. I, I heard the town manager say something different at that meeting. So I, I'm just uh, questioning where the 500,000 shows up in our budget. Well, it doesn't. It, it's, uh, uh, we don't actually vote it. It's just the whole budget is balanced with the thought that we'd have 500,000 deficit from this year <coughs> rolling ahead. And since we're not going to have $500,000 deficit rolling ahead, you know, that's the way we pay for it. Treasury, we don't have to vote on that because if there's no deficit, there's no deficit to be rolled. Actually, Peter, you could you could almost said uh, voted, you know, the uh, reserve fund. Uh, uh, to be to be paid for because there's no snow and ice deficit. Anticipated. Anticipated, good word. Okay, any other corrections? I have one, I think, under the budget seven treasurer on the back page. You have Citizens Bank is now handling the town's funds. I think it's Century, Century Bank. Century, it's Century Bank. Bank. Yeah. Right. So cross out Citizens and turn it to Century, which is now operating out of an old Mr. Donuts shop at North Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, any other corrections or discussion? All those in favor of accepting the minutes as corrected, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Done. Okay, uh, I'm assuming everybody has the public schools or the, uh, oh, this is the only temple, okay. For some reason I thought it was kind of handy. Okay. 
I'm going to hand out now our uh, proclamation on the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Uh, we're going to be actually hearing this uh, a week from next Monday. So this is, uh, this is something we're going to be asked to consider. But this is so you can study it and come up with all kinds of questions. Okay, uh, the main topic of 7.39, we're four minutes late, please forgive us, uh, is the Arlington Public School budget. Uh, hopefully you've all studied this and have lots of good questions. Um, so, uh, Superintendent Bodie, would you like to start the presentation? Good evening. First of all, um, thank you for having us tonight. It's always nice to, um, to join you. Um, I'd like to um, introduce uh, uh, pr pretty much everyone that you know here from the school committee. We have um, our chair, Paul Flickman, vice chair, Jennifer Suess, and Bill Painter. Dr. Ampey is on our way. And from central office, um, Laura Steffen, who is the assistant superintendent, many of you know, and Diane Johnson, who you also, probably everyone knows. So uh, tonight we've uh, put together a presentation to look at uh, the FY17 budget. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly um, and leave more of time for uh, questions that you might have. So tonight when I uh, review this, I'm going to look at the, um, talk a little bit about the budget development process and timeline, some of the FY16 year-to-date uh, news, major discussion points for the FY17 budget, which includes enrollment and the school enrollment task force, which I know um, Al would like to have more discussion on this evening. And then looking into the future about the technology plan and special education uh, expenses and interventions. On um, the next page you have the uh, school committee. You also have, following that, the budget timeline, which I think at this point you're pretty familiar with uh, in the process that we go through, which actually begins in the early fall as we take a look at um, our budget with all of the administrators and there's discussion with teachers and in fact, in December, um, the elementary principals and the secondary principals meet with the school committee to talk about um, their perspective for the upcoming budget. Involved in the process are the principals and people who in central office. Um, also, all of our curriculum coordinators, and it's sort of, I think it's nice for you to have their names and people who actually contribute to the production of the, the budget as well as helping with this presentation and the uh, report to town meeting that you'll all be receiving um, sometime before, the oh, actually the night of the opening of town meeting. <laughs> so as we look at um, the year to date in sort of some major events for the school department, um, one, uh, one has to do with Stratton. We have been moving forward with the construction project. Uh, the plan is still in place for construction to begin in June of this year and to com be completed by August 2017. We had um, a change in uh, modular companies in the last few weeks, but we are still remaining um, on, on the schedule to, make, to have the modulars in place for the start of the school year. As you all know, the MSBA board invited the high school um, into the eligibility period. That vote occurred in January, and there'll be a, a second vote at the end of May, in fact, May 25th, in which they formally invite us to commence the process. As you also probably all have read and, and are aware, we, we completed a space study analysis 
which has been the topic of a lot of discussion over the last few months, as well as um, an enrollment forecast. We had an update on that forecast in December, and this was prepared by uh, McKibben, um, uh, Dr. McKibben. Also this fall, in response to what we anticipate is a, a continued trend of enrollment growth, we have an enrollment task force, which um, we have several members in this room that are on that committee, uh, to look at what our options are for uh, how to address the enrollment growth in the schools. I'm talking a little bit about that in a minute. But in terms of enrollment, since FY13, we have increased in the school department 534 new students. So our enrollment this year is 5,410. Now, there are two types of enrollment projections we have. We, the school department has its own methodology of projecting enrollment, it's, but it's based on a weighted average of the actuals from previous years. And it basically, is sort of, it's just a mathematical formula, it's a straight line. And if we were to use the school department projection analysis, we would expect an increase of 196 students for FY17. Dr. McKibben did a, uh, a, a new update on his forecast from last summer in December, and with that forecast, he uh, expects the <coughs> district to see 121 students for FY17. And it's important to note that one difference between the school department uh, prediction and the Dr. McKibben's is that we include out -of students in out-of-district placements and his proje um, projections do not, his forecast does not. Now, depending upon which, which the prediction, the mathematical formula, or the forecasting, one thing that both agree on is that the school district is going to, is going to hit 6,000. The only difference is, is when that is going to happen. And the same thing that's true for the high school and, and having the high school have an enrollment of, six, of over 1,600. Again, the only difference is the timeline. So the task force has been meeting uh, since this fall and uh, considered numerous options for how to uh, provide additional space for the school department. And there's been a number of options that have been taken off the table. And where the current thinking is right now, of course, we're moving forward with the high school. But in terms of uh, where, how we're going to address the enrollment growth at Otteson, we have two options, uh, and one is, one is putting an addition on the existing building in possibly one of, two uh, one of two locations. And the other is putting Gibbs back in service to the school department. And presently, there is a uh, study that the committee has um, voted to approve that, is, that will be looking in much more depth at both of, at both of these options, um, bringing in electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, structural, uh, cost estimator. So we expect that probably by the start of town meeting, we will have a, um, a much better look at what the costs will be and the, the, the pros and cons of, the, of each one of those um, options. And of course, we have to keep an eye on the evolving enrollment. I will, I will make a note to, to say to you, though, that as of today, we have already registered for next year 50 additional students, which is more than we had at this time last year. So it's hard to say what, what we find with um, enrollment growth, and that's at all <coughs> levels. That's 50 students across the, the, uh, pre, uh, the K-12. Most of our growth we see late spring, early summer. If you look at the next graph that you have and by the way, for those that are watching this evening, we've had this, I should have said this at the beginning, we have uploaded um, this presentation onto the district website. And so if you go to the Arlington Public Schools website, it, you will find that there. And we will also um, 
make sure that it's in, it, probably the town will want this presentation as well. If you look at the next graph, the bar graph, you can see what the trend is from 2011, 2010's 2011 school year out to 2020-21. And, and we really can't, as a, a, in terms of our predictions in the school department, really go out much more than that because it is, sim it is based on the students that are already in our school system. But what the clear, the clear message of this graph is that we're increasing. If you look <coughs> at the next bar graph, uh, this bar graph, again, goes from the 2010-11 school year, but this goes out to 25-26, because this is Dr. McKibben's numbers based on a forecast with an entirely different methodology. But again, the one thing that you can see is there's going to be an increase, but in his forecast, there looks like a little bit of plateauing off as we get into the out years. In response to the enrollment growth that we have experienced in the district, um, I, I want to thank all of you and thank the town uh, for helping to address this with the, with the school department in providing additional, reven uh, additional revenue for our budget to meet this growing enrollment. So the enrollment has been growing faster than we predicted uh, when the five-year plan was approved. Uh, as I said, in the last three years, we've had over 500 students. Previously, what we call the growth factor, that was set at 25% um, of the per, per, per pupil cost for the additional enrollment each year. What will change for the FY17 budget is that that dollar amount will increase to $35. The next chart um, has a breakdown of what uh, the FY17 growth factor has, looks like with, with all of the, um, uh, the, the parts of the budget for, for general education, special, uh, special education, the kindergarten offset fee, which has remained constant for, since we, we were able to um, be reimbursed by the state through Chapter 70 for the full day program and then the growth factor. As you can see, between FY16 and FY17, there'll be an increase um, from 530,000 to 973,000. Part of that increase is also applying the $35 uh, to the growth over these last three years as well. So the Arlington Public Schools has a, a very definite vision for our mission. And that is that we want to have every student be ready for college and career and active citizenship. And, and I, I emphasize the every student because that, that, that statement informs a lot of the decisions we make around the budget. But we also uh, are committed to the professional development, to building staff capacity so that we're an, we're an ever improving school district. We want to provide an excellent education, and we do at a, at a, at a very effective cost. The Allegan Public Schools are in the 90th percentile of all school districts in the state, and I know that because the Department of Education has confirmed that percent, percentile. But our per pupil cost is less than the state average. So I think that we are doing a very good job of providing a very excellent education for a very effective cost. The other uh, value we hold is to work in partnership with all town departments and certainly uh, to remain in collaboration and communication with all stakeholders. So as we look at FY17, we are going to have um, some revenue increases and we've had to go, th we've had to think very deeply about what our priorities will be for next year because all that we, um, feel that we should be, should be funding is not going to be possible with the revenue that we will have. 
<laughs> so what are our priorities for next year? Well, one is that we are now in the second year of new contracts, both for our teachers and our, and our administrators, and we have a 2% growth, 2% uh, increase for all staff that are outside of uh, collective bargaining. This, this item alone represents slightly more than half of the additional revenue. We also have to um, adjust for enrollment growth and class size mitigation. And one, one place we'll see that is at the Addison Middle School. We are going to fund an additional, eighth uh, additional half cluster um, and also all of the specialists that are, that are needed in order to support um, these students. We will have, um, we have four reserve positions, but already we know that two are going to be for Thompson because we are going to be, we're going to be adding two modulars to Thompson next year. And the other two reserve positions are most likely going to be elementary. In fact, they're most likely going to be at Hardy. We, we know for certain that one of them will be at Hardy. We also need to increase um, nursing support at the middle school as well as social worker support both for um, a supported learning, supported learning program as well as Audison. And uh, we need a, we're going to fund a co-taught math. That means that's a, that's a co-taught means that you're going to have a general education teacher in the content, uh, certified in the content area as well as a special education teacher. And then one of the other um, important areas is curriculum mater uh, materials and for the, for the district and also to have curriculum materials as we move forward in certain areas of our curriculum, math, science, but also to replace textbooks that are so outdated it's almost embarrassing. We had geography books that go back to the 1950s. And so you can, you, you, I'm sure you know we're probably not using those books as much as we should because they're so outdated, but we do need to update that, those materials. And there's also a lot of unfunded mandates that the school department is under and that we will be using to fund that. If you go to the next page, you'll see a six-year comparison by budget transfer categories. So these are the major categories. We have elementary, secondary, special education, curriculum and instruction, administration, and everything else. And that's IT, facilities, transportation. Now, what you see in this is that in the first three categories, the categories that most directly affect our students in the classroom, elementary, secondary, and special ed, every year there's an increase in those budget areas. In contrast, if you look at the other three in curriculum uh, and instruction, which is a lot of our professional development and other support materials, administration and other, it's relatively flat over these um, six years. So whenever we have an increase in revenue, that money is, is funneling directly into supporting our students in their classroom. If you go to the next page, um, here is a, a quick overview summary of the FY17 proposed budget changes. So the net increase in revenue is $3.2 million, of which nearly 1.7 is going to contractual and salary increases, leaving about 1.5 for all the other priorities that we have identified. Now there's another number here of 2.35, which represents the um, increases that we felt that were needed, but we are not gonna be able to fund. And if you'd like a complete listing of that, it is um, in the uh, superintendent's budget message in the book that you have. And for those watching that, the entire budget is also on the district website and what you just need to do is to go to school committee at the top and go to budget and you'll find it. The next uh, page, page 19, 
is a graph uh, that you've seen before. It's just it's basically taking the information you've already seen and um, displaying it a little differently in a circle graph just to see uh, relatively the proportions that each one of these um, different cost centers um, represent of the total budget. So moving on, page uh, next page, funding the vision. So the FY17 revenues um, of the school department is 62.6 million dollars. This represents a total of 5.4 percent increase from last year. Now, if you look just simply at town appropriations, that percentage is different. But as you know, the revenue for the, a, a school department. Um, encompasses other other sources, uh, one being grants and another being fees. Now, the town appropriation increase is a 3.4. Um, the thing that we do know are the grants are projected to decline. We're pr almost certain that Title I is going to decline, which has actually provided a, um, quite a few um, positions for for math and literacy intervention. The kindergarten grant at the moment is, is, is expected to decline, but there is the possibility that it'll get funded. And um, that would be terrific if it does, but at the moment that's not the expectation. So we have um, also fees and re reimbursements, reimbursements are projected to increase by a little over 100,000. And that includes 250,000 prior year reserves. The FY16 circuit breaker payment of 1.8 will be used in FY17. And as you recall, we were able a number of years ago to get into a cycle where we're one year out. So we always, we always know what our circuit breaker number is going to be. I remember years ago where that was always a, a floating number that we might not know until June or July, but uh, we do know what that number is now. In the next page, um, the pro FY17 proposed budget funding summary uh, takes the 62.6 and, and uh, shows its distribution among the three major funding sources. Clearly, the town appropriation is the, the major source of funding for, this, for the school department. One of the... Um, one of the other areas that we remain very grateful to the town is to helping us support a technology plan. And I, I thank Capital again, the Capital Planning Committee again this year for continuing to fund the, the technology needs that we, we, we need. And I think one, uh, we've, said this, we've said this before and I just, it's, it's worthwhile saying again, we're not looking to increase our technology to increase our technology. We really have a, a very definite plan for how we're going to use it. And we use it with some very key ideas in mind in terms of, the, in terms of education and what goes on in a classroom. We want students to be able to work independently and collaboratively with both. We want them, and this is really important, to be able to analyze and synthesize multiple forms of evidence. And I think that in, as our society becomes more complex, this skill is increasingly more important, both in work life and just in being a good citizen. There is just so, you're bombarded with so, so much information, you need to be able to synthesize and have evidence for your point of view or for the work you're doing. Uh, which then uh, provides you to be able to create some very robust arguments. And we have to be able to do that both orally written and, and digital form today. So as we look at the technology priorities for this next, uh, for this next budget uh, cycle, um, one thing that I, I don't know if you know is that the state is moving into what they call um, MCAS 2.0, which is the, the evolution of the MCAS. Uh, it's very clear that it's going to be very park-like, which is actually one of the reasons why the district this year is going to be uh, assessing using park, just to have the experience for our students and our staff. 
But one of the other parts of this change is that by 2019, the expectation in the state is that all students will be, will be tested online. As we move into park this year, we had the Odyssey Middle School being tested online, as well as one of our elementary schools, and that's Bishop. Um, MCAS and now MCAS Point 2 or Park are not the only assessments that our students are increasingly being um, asked to be tested on digitally. Uh, one is the access test uh, for English language learners and also uh, all of the national language exams. Teachers also need um, computers both for their instruction, which they increasingly are using all the time, as well as for the new educator evaluation system. 45% of our assistive technology for special education is five years or older, and um, th that those devices will be replaced in FY17. And we've already begun this year in doing a replacement plan for the Thompson one-to-one. -one. one third were, were replaced this year of the devices and one third next year and, and then the last in 18. Okay, moving on, talking about a little bit about special education and uh, interventions. This is page 26. <clears throat> When we look at special education costs, um, we are looking at a very defined set of costs. And I, and I thank Diane Johnson for um, s sticking to this over the years because unless we do have that definition and we are rigorous in applying the definition, it's very hard to really compare special education costs uh, year to year. But special education costs in Arlington includes all of the special education grant funded costs, the legal and transportation costs that are directly supporting special education students. The definition of interventions in Arlington includes all of our math and literacy, um, uh, RTI, academic challenge, any enrichment, guidance, and the thing about interventions, they support not only special education students, but general education students who struggle. So why are both needed special education uh, uh, services as well as interventions? Well, special educations are legally mandated services. But we also have students that struggle who are not eligible for special education services, and these uh, interventions support their growth. And I go back again to the vision. Our vision is that all students are able to be prepared for college and career. <coughs> and one, of the, one area that we look at in terms of the, the feedback we have from assessments is to look at how our high need students are doing. And, and every year that gap is d decreasing. We would like to see it decreasing faster than it is. But the only way that we're going to see that is if we invest in the kinds of interventions that are going to support these students. Another thing that is happening, it used to be that the services for ELL, our English language learners, uh, were recommended interventions. They are no longer going to be recommended. They are going to be mandated. And there are very de definite rules in terms of who can teach ELL students and how, how much intervention they need and pull out. It's a rather, um, rather substantial mandate. So if you look to the next page, we have a five-year comparison showing intervention expenses. <coughs> and again, we're looking at um, general education, intervention, special education, direct professional development, and administration infrastructure. So as you look from FY13 through, <coughs> we, have, we have the actuals through 15, and then we have 16 projected at the end, and of course 17 is definitely proposed. The thing that you'll notice for general education, which is the first column, is that we are, we are investing <coughs> in general education. Um, but that is also a reflection of the enrollment growth that we have, because as our students' enrollment grows, so does our, our cost. <coughs> the thing to notice in the next one, which is um, a little bit lighter blue, this is our interventions. As a, 
for the first two years, um, it was fairly flat, and then it, um, in FY15, it grew a little bit, but it has remained flat again. So even though general education costs are growing, our interventions um, are, fairly, are fairly flat. Special education also is growing. Um, now, for direct professional development, you, you can barely see the top of the bar <laughs> in each one of these. But I don't want you to think that we do not, we're not committed to professional development. In fact, we are very committed and we offer a variety of opportunities for teachers. In fact, there are professional development companies people think is a speaker coming from the outside or going off to a conference. Th those certainly are and they're certainly worthwhile. But what the research shows is the most effective professional development in affecting student performance is when teachers work together, they look at data together, make interventions based on that data, do walkthroughs with each other, have mentoring. And so those are the types of professional development we are um, more heavily invested <coughs> in, and that is sometimes more of an investment of time. Um, and then if you look at the administration and infrastructure, you'll see that, again, that's, well, there's been a slight increase. It's not been very much. And um, our, our priorities have been always to put the money back to, to, into the classroom. And this is no small issue either, as the mandates uh, have increased from the state around teacher evaluation, our, the number of administrators we have to carry out those mandates has not grown. If you look at the next graph, um, you can, th this is special education expense by funding source. Most of the funding uh, over these years has, the, the, the vast bulk of it has come from town appropriation. You can see the smaller bar, a blue bar, uh, is circuit breaker. And I think the thing to notice about circuit breaker is h how variable it has been, because it's always on your past, um, it's always based on a formula on past expenses. And uh, just like special education, those costs can vary from year to year. And, uh, but fortunately, we are now in a budget cycle where we can anticipate it using the year previous. And then special education grants total, you can see um, as the darker blue here. And the thing that is noticeable in that is that while the highest was FY11, and ever since then, those grants have come down. And the, the, next, the next graph, uh, you've seen something like this before, which is looking at special education, and you've seen it before, looking at it over 10 years, and you always see this kind of um, jagged line. And once again, from looking from FY12 through the proposed FY17, you will see a, a jagged line. As we look at FY17, um, and you see that that's going up, I am sure that you're thinking, why? <laughs> what, what do we know now why that is going up? Well. Uh, for, for one thing, as enrollment goes up, uh, we're also going to be increasing special education costs. Um, but as enrollment goes up, goes up, we also have in-district programs that we need to expand. And one area we've expanding is we're going to, part of those budget priorities was to have two <coughs> special education uh, teachers at the elementary, uh, more social workers uh, for uh, special education uh, programs. We also know that in terms of salaries, as, as a group, special education teachers are um, newer to the district, and as a result, that group disproportionately, uh, salaries are going faster because they have step in lanes as well as the percent increase. Another major factor is our home services are growing. And these are students that need to have home services. In fact, our contractual number this year, I think, is around <coughs> an increase of about 70,000 over expected. And we're seeing, anticipating more even next year. Another area uh, is that we've had, this year, much more than last year, um, we have more extended, more requests for extended evaluations. And each time we have an extended evaluation, 
of a student. That is, ranges in the cost of about 10000 to 20000 And of the students that have extended evaluations, nearly 90% of those students will go into out-of-district placement. So the very fact that those requests are up is evidence that we're going to be seeing some uptick there as well. So those are some of the reasons why we're anticipating this growth. So that is the bulk of it, and I just would like to end by, um, again, thanking you and, and saying that the Arlington, the Arlington School Committee, I'm speaking for them, <laughs> respectfully request your approval of the FY17 budget uh, voted by the School Committee on March 10th, 2016. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, I will throw it open to uh, questions from the Finance Committee. You're overwhelmed. <laughs> let, let me, um, I'm sorry, Peter. I have a kind of a stupid question. Is intervention and tutoring essentially the same thing? They can be, yes. They can be definitely the same thing. Um, but it's, it's also more, it's more, more services. It could be social work, it could be, could be guidance, it could be small group instruction. We do have tutors. Um, it could be coaching of teachers. There's a lot of ways that we support teachers. Thank you. Okay, Bill? With the Otterson uh, Middle School, it just seems in previous discussions and now that it, it's a moving target of sorts. And by that I mean, uh, you have a pretty good idea of what the inflows are from the elementary schools, but um, it's not really clear how these new students are going to be accommodated in terms of being bused someplace else, in terms of their <coughs> siblings having other needs from the school. And I guess my real question is, um, is, is there a long-term plan to create a second uh, middle school? Or we just, it seems like maybe we're just pushing things along and, and, and accommodating or taking care of each budget as it comes up. And I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong either. I'm just, mm -hmm. uh, well, that is actually the task before the school enrollment task force is to um, look at what, how we're going to accommodate this growing enrollment. Next year is going to be tight in the school. We'll be having much more shared classrooms. And it's just going to feel a lot tighter as we increase the numbers. The following year, we next year is the tipping point. The following year we need modular classrooms uh, for the middle school. But as we look long term, we're seeing that it's going to increase about uh, another 250 students. And that's, that's a significant number and, and certainly not possible in the existing building. So the task force right now is looking at, well, should we add an addition? And if we do, should it be on the, for the lot side, the, the forest side, I don't know, which, the front, actually it's the front of the school, or it should be on the Mass Ave side down on the, the soccer field. That's, that's one area. The other possibility is for the school department to take Gibbs back for school use. Uh, and we're looking at a study right now as to what the cost for renovation would be. Now, if, we, if the decision goes toward Gibbs, then there's another decision to be made. Is that going to be a single grade that goes to Gibbs, or is it going to be a six through eight? And that's a, that's a decision the school committee will have to uh, discuss and decide. But we can, no, we can no longer, after next year, manage within the existing building. Uh, just a, my own question. What's a half a cluster? I think I understand what a full cluster is. That's a good question. Of four, four classes for the four subjects. Right. What's a half a cluster? It means that you have two teachers for half that number of students. Um, so we, a half cluster, it's going to be at eighth grade next year. A uh, half cluster will have two teachers. One teacher has to be certified in math and science, and the other one English and social studies. So if a, if a cluster, is around 120 students, then a half cluster will be roughly around 60 students. And they will take their specials. The, actually, one of the hard parts about having half clusters is scheduling specials. Because usually a cluster goes out 
as a cluster to all the different specials they might have, whether it be art, music, family consumer science, uh, technology, phys ed, ACE. I mean, so they go out as clusters. So when you have a half cluster, it's going to present some scheduling challenges. Charlie? Dr. Bodie, I have some questions on the uh, special education experiences. Sure. <clears throat> and, um, you know, my, I've expressed in the past my concern that um, we have a, a guideline of a 7% mm -hmm. increase in the special education budget. And I keep looking at these numbers every year, and I see historically that the increase is always less than 7%. But not always. Well. Um, I'm taking a view that I've been looking at it for five or six years now. It seems that it's the, the average rate of increase is less than uh, 7%. And in, the, in your budget book, the total on a three year basis, the total increase, according to my calculation, is the compound is 5% a year, not 7% a year. Okay. And if I look at the presentations that you gave, I have some trouble. Um, correlating some different numbers here. Um, so on page uh, 17, you have uh, the six-year comparison by budget transfer categories. I'm sorry, could you speak up? Budget transfer categories do not include grant money, and so that's why the numbers look different. The budget transfer categories correlate to the section in the budget book, I believe it's section four, and it explicitly excludes grant money. It includes only town appropriation and revolving funds. So those numbers will not foot out to the entire special ed budget because that doesn't do grant money. Well, I mean, my understanding is that when we calculate the town contribution to the budget, we have a rate of increase that's based on um, I think it's three and a half percent or something like that, plus the growth factor on the general education and seven percent on special education. And if I look on page 17, um, and, and Diane, you're saying that this is this is the town stuff. This is and, and I, and I want to I want to keep separate here the subject of expense and income. Okay. Um, okay. And so this is, this is, this, let's see, one, two, three, four year average through fiscal year 16. So these are all actual. <coughs> I calculate to be a 2.6% compounded growth rate. That's even further away from the 7% than the 5% that's in the book. Okay. And I'm not counting the pr proposed, I'm counting the actuals, fiscal 12 through 16. So that's four, four years of growth. That is a subset of our entire growth. So that is not all of our growth in special education. You know, one of the things that makes our special education growth different is, um, is the grant contribution, which is not part of that. So I haven't looked ex expl expressly at special education growth according to this limited view. If, however, you look at special education growth according to all special education expenditures, without regard to funding source. I think, you know, my, my calculations say it averages out to about 6.9%, which you are correct, is less than seven. Now the 6.9%, I'm talking about actuals. The 6.9% includes the proposed um, fiscal year 17. Over how many years are each of you looking at? We're just looking at this time horizon from FY11. We are not going back in time. If we were to go further back in time, that would make that average higher. That uh, Mr. Foskett is correct that we have had less growth, but still significant volatility in this time horizon from FY11 to the present. I guess what, where I'm coming from here. <coughs> I mean, when, when, we, when we get a special education grant, we get a grant, let's see how I can express this correctly. Do we spend the money because we get the grant, or would we spend the money anyway? And, and if we spend the money anyway, we should, be looking at, we should be looking at expenses and then revenues. 
We spend the money anyway because it's mandated. Okay. The way we classify special education expense is mandated. However, anything we can put in a grant, we will put in a grant. So we will spare but, the town appropriation to the maximum possible extent. Except that you don't because you budgeted at 7%. In other words, the, the appropriation that's calculated for the town is based on a 7% calculation. So basically we're discussing slide 14, the detail of the FY17 growth factor. Right there, we just went past it. <clears throat> so if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're taking umbrage with is the fact that, that we've been calculating 7% for a number of years now and that you don't feel it's justified. Am I correct? Well, I wouldn't use the term umbrage. I'm trying to understand how we're, how we're reporting things and how we're budgeting. I think umbrage is a little bit pejorative. Um, What I'm saying is that we are, this is, the, this is the formula that I understand that we have been applying, okay? Um, so we're calculating this budget every year based on a 7% <coughs> growth, mm -hmm. but the data that you show as historical can be as low as 2.5% growth. That is correct, because the understanding has been in years when we have a bad sped year and we're spending, you know, we have 12 or 13% growth that we have to make that whole on our side which we have done historically. And that jagged bar graph really shows that very well. We have years of low growth and we have years of high growth. And you know, we have this discussion every year and I continue to show the special ed expenses as they are because I want the special ed expenses to show what we can't get out of. Except because someday the rain's gonna dry up and we're gonna have a drought and we're gonna have to make cuts and these are the things we cannot cut. Okay, where is the, where's, where is the, if, if the number is 2.5% or 2.6% and not 7%, there's a 5% difference. 5% uh, of $20 million is a $1 million. So you should have a $5 million reserve someplace. Where is it? Well, I think you know where it is. No, I don't. I'm asking the question. I don't know where it is. It is going into helping us sustain our growth. Because the so, 35% of okay, the people so is So this is a discussion we have every year. Yes. You're spending the money. Yes. And it's not being spent on special education. And what I'm trying to say is this 7% metric is just plain wrong. And you've been saying that for several years. That's right. Uh, let, me, let me just interject a second. Um, when we look at it historically, and I, I think it's really important to, to look at it this way, that we can't predict how special is going to go, going to go in a year. I remember a year where in August we had two students move in that needed residential placement. We never know this. Now, so the point is this. There are some years where we really have to cut back in other things uh, for our students when it goes as high as 12%. And we've looked at that. When we set the five-year plan, we looked at a 10-year, eight-year. We've looked at all the different kinds of averages over time, and they averaged out to 7%. You're absolutely correct that in a given year, in fact, the last two years we've done very well. I have to say we've done very well. And, but we also were in a situation where we had an enrollment growth where the money that we had was inadequate. So I don't expect that's going to be the case next year given all the predictors that we're seeing right now, um, that that's going to be the case. We're probably going to need to use 7%, hopefully not more than 7% next year. So, I, I, you know, when we look at special education, there is, it's very difficult to do much, do something different than what we're doing right now, honestly. How else would we do it? If we, can, if we use the previous year's actual, that could be wrong. You could overinflate the next year based on the actual, you could underinflate, or you could not give adequate money. Dr. Bodhi, I've been on the finance committee for about 20 years. Maybe 25 years. And I have heard of, I mean, I know that the, 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 the uh, uh, chaotic, uh, stochastic behavior of arrival of different types of special education students and what it costs the town at different times. However, I've been arguing probably for 20 of those 25 years that. If you, if you have a long-term average of 7%, you have a long-term average of 7%. But in the last 10 years, the school department has not had a long-term average of 7%. And when I pointed it out uh, several years ago on the data that was given to me by Ms. Mrs. Johnson, 
uh, she, said, she said at this meeting, oh, if that's not right, and threw the piece of paper out. And now we're looking at data she's given again. It says 2.5% compound growth. And I'm being told that, well, yeah, that's correct. Okay. So the way you manage this is you take the difference between the 2.5% and the 7% and you put it in a bank account. And then you have a reserve for when the stochastic problems occur. And then eventually you can lower the rate that you have to spend at. But the, the, your argument is based on which is based on the fact that that the town appropriations is the only source. If you look at another graph, you'll see one of the things that's happened with um, both circuit breaker and state grant the grants. The grants have actually come down, so we're mandated to spend to provide services. Now. That percentage that we get for those services can vary from the different sources. And what I think what we need to do is, is look at the, the, to, the totality of it. You want us to look at just simply the appropriations for the, for the town and, and have that be evidence that we're, only, we're doing 7%. But if a, a federal grant goes down, then how do we pay for, then we, the more the town services has to kick in or vice versa. And we've seen both of that over time. <coughs> Do you, uh, Diane, you've uh, produced a sheet the last several years that had it uh, over the last 10 years um, what the average was. And I think that's what the long-term planning committee does look at. Um, and uh, do you have that available? Would it be available? I do not. That sheet I had to build out of desperation when I came here because I couldn't go back in time except by using the end of the year report. And the information I have to pull together, it just doesn't fit together very nicely with the way we report to the state. So if you look at this section on special education in the budget book, which is section 11, I believe. 10. 10. Thank you. Um, this only goes back to FY13, but I have the data back to FY11. And having calculated it from FY11 forward, and I'm sorry it's not in this view because I can't, it's already really tiny and hard to read, um, that the overall rate across those years is I believe 6.9% from the time horizon of FY11. And this includes everything. This is all of the things that we're expending that are strictly defined as meeting the needs of special education students only doesn't include the interventions, which it would be perfectly legitimate to say are special education expenses, when the vast majority of the students receiving reading services are special ed kids. But we're counting that under general ed. We're not counting that under SCAD. So this doesn't have the full time horizon back to FY11. But if we did, then we would show that I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident that it's 6.9% averaging across that time horizon from FY11 to the present. And this is the view that we really need to look at because this is the all-in view. This is what we're spending on special education. This is where we spent it and on what we spent it. Defined strictly, we have not changed the definition of SPED, so this is a real apples to apples across time. <coughs> now this is uh, totals 20,507, and you have the uh, this is, a this is a different view. This does not include grant money. So, you know, when we try to put these different reports, they're very different views. And so I, I'm sorry for the confusion. But if you really want to look at special education expenses, this is the section we need to look at. So which section should we look at? It's section, section 10. Section 10. 10. So 20 million, 507, 602. Correct. And that includes whatever money you do for grants. Correct. Yeah, I think obviously this is another uh, million four over what you have on this chart. Correct, and that, that represents the grant money that's not counted in that chart. The, the, budget, the budget transfer categories are the way the school committee votes the budget to control the budget from within. And grants stand outside those line item controls that they exercise because grants are independent projects. And so that is done to reflect their needs, but it's not a good basis of comparison to be looking at an expense across the entire district. Question. Okay, uh, Charlie and then Dean. If you are spending 
X from grants, shouldn't you be calculating the town contribution based on the growth in the difference? In other words, that's the two point, the 2.6 percent is the growth in the town spending. It's not seven percent. I disagree. Dean? All right. Um, so first, thanks for coming in, and thanks for always fun, and thanks for the book. I really like this book. I think I said this every year, but it is it is very easy to sort of drill down to whatever you want to see and and, and figure it out. So I do appreciate you putting it together. Um, just again, I just to, to question on special ed as well. So, so I'm not going to disagree with the the seven percent growth rate of the year budgetary number, but what I think is interesting is, uh, let's say our five-year special ed increase is 7%, while at the same time our student enrollment has gone up a staggering amount. <coughs> I don't know the exact number off, off the top of my head right now. So if, if you just assume for a second that the population of your children receiving special education services doesn't change, even though the budgetary increase is 7%, which we started doing in 2012. I mean, you could conclude that we, we are seeing a slowing down of special ed costs. Because I would assume if we didn't have 1,000 kids more, it wouldn't be 7% anymore. I would, I'd like to, I agree with you, and I'd like to support that in two things. Um, Allison Elmer, our special ed director, mentioned to me today that we are holding steady in terms of our percentage of students receiving special ed services. So that's a good sign. So even though our overall growth is increasing, we are increasing numbers of special ed students, but they are not out of step with the overall enrollment growth. The other thing I think we're really seeing bear fruit is our interventions work. That at one point our special ed costs were really escalating because we were unable to provide the intervention services that in many cases give the kids what they need before it's necessary to get them formalized into special education. That when you don't have a good interventions program, you have general ed, and then you have the kids that are unsuccessful, and when there's nothing in between, they have no choice, their parents push them towards special education. But now we have a robust interventions program. We have a reading program, we have math coaching, we're doing math interventions, and so we're reaching the needs of more kids before they reach the special ed threshold. So I think that shows a couple of good things that we've done for infrastructure and investments we've made to help contain special ed costs. That said, special ed is a tiger that you always have by the tail, and you can't really control those costs. You know, two bad move-ins and you're blown away again. Well, right, but but, but I think the, 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 maybe the positive thing out of this is, in some ways, special education. The seven percent is really a, a, a fixed cost, whatever that may be, plus a growth factor on the rising enrollment and the kids coming in to the system. And I, I do think it's a positive thing because there were many years we were sitting here looking at that seven percent, wondering if it was. It was ever going to slow down under any circumstance. And it seems like if we didn't have the other problems, we might have seen slowing to some degree. And I worry that if we, if enrollment growth continues to sap our budget, and we cannot continue to invest in those interventions to keep pace with the greater enrollment, that we are going to see at some point the payoff and an uptick in SPED. You know, right now we're not able to extend reading services to as many children as truly need them because we can't grow the reading program because we're busy trying to keep the class sizes down and there isn't enough money there and I'm afraid that if we can't keep putting money into those interventions, we're going to see the spike eventually pay off and spend, which is what we don't want to see. So my next question is, um, we talked for many years, probably my entire time on the Finance Committee, about in-district program for special mm -hmm. education so because it would be more cost effective and keep the kids in the community and, and things like that. So obviously that must have a, that has an effect on our school facilities. It does. Um, Never so thought about it at the time. The, the kind of woke up in November and realized. <laughs> well, um, the SLC classrooms, as you know, are designed to be much more intensive programs for higher needs students. And so the ratio of students to teachers is much different. A classroom to take a building like the Stratton that was originally designed to hold 30 kids, maybe holding six in the SLC program that's housed there. And, we, and with that six, a teacher, two or three aides, and a number of related service providers. It's a much more expensive delivery, but even if you're spending the same amount of money on the educational resources as you would sending them out of district, you're at least not paying transportation, and you're meeting the dictates of least restrictive environment. Right. But it eats up space, you're absolutely okay, right. So it's fair to say, though, that the, the, the 
victory that we have in saving cost within district special education is also on, on the other side hurting on the facilities Absolutely. because we now have nine rooms, whatever. Well, and the specialty needs that come with these intensive programs, social work, um, OT, speech, these are providers that need space to work in that isn't necessarily a classroom. Sometimes they push into the classroom, but other times they pull the children out to treat them and they need, you know, so what we really need is more office space and therapeutic space. And the school, that, well, the school like the Stratton me, didn't build for that. My wife's an elementary school in another community and she tells me all the time about the closet that they have for it right now, mm -hmm. so I can fully agree with you there. And newer schools, if you look at the Thompson and how that was designed, there is was there was some nice related service provider space. As with the Pierce, they were designed with this in mind. And when we're reconstructing the Stratton, this is a change we're going to make. We're going to take a classroom and break it up and put it into related service provider space. But then again, it's lost forever as a classroom, as enrollment growth. Got it. OK, so then the last question I have, because I just want to make sure I understand how this book works. So if I go to section, section 10, we were on it, so I might as well just go there. So we have the FY17 level service column, and then next to it's the FY17 edition. Mm -hmm. So do those tie to the front of the book? They, they tie to the superintendent's budget message, which is section two. Right. And if you, and if you go into the spreadsheets in section two, okay. they will tie back to the first section. Get there and I'll tell you the page number. Right, so that's what that column does represent. It's Correct. It's two just laid into it. You can tie all of these out into the budget centers that they live in. And you can see that throughout the budget through any of the views. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. John? Excuse me, one more comment I'd like to make that wasn't made with respect to our supported learning centers. You're absolutely right in facilities. I still think that they're more cost effective, but I think another piece of this is really important is that. By not having the, our children have to go to an out-of-district placement, we keep them part of the community in which they live. And uh, I, 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 I know that special education parents prefer that. Uh, they'd much rather have them in our Arlington Public Schools. And, and that's not all the time, because sometimes there are students that we, we do not have the resources for, or it's not a cost-effective model. But for those students that can, it's a, it's a preferred option. Okay. John? Uh, I just went back to page 9 and did a simple calculation. Uh, you have 534 new students in the past three years, and the total now is 5,410. So that's an order of 10% over three years. So Actually, like, four years. Like that's 3% okay. a year just due to, to could, could be yes, just due to the increase in population. <laughs> We are definitely absorbing a tremendous number of students. Okay, uh, Paul, Bill, Peter, Allen. At the end of this current fiscal year, how much will you be putting into the special ed reserve? I think it's too soon to tell. I think we really have to see how the year comes out. Um, I mean, according to this page 7 of 7 of section 10, you're running like a $600,000 surplus in special ed? We are running significantly under budget and out of district tuition at the moment. However, there's two factors that make me not want to commit to anything at this point. One is that we've seen an uptick in the number of um, referred 45-day um, placements. These are placements where students are sent out for an extended evaluation out of district. And as Dr. Bodie said earlier, 90% of those end up in out of district tuition. I'm also holding back because as the weather warms up, we see it every year, things pop up and kids go out of district in the spring. And so at this point, while, we're, while it's looking excellent, I wouldn't want to bet on anything right now. Thank you. Okay, Bill. I was going to say, uh, I, when I grew up and I went through a school system in my town, there was no such thing as special ed. <laughs> we're all grouped together. And one thing that strikes me is some of these bar graphs are very linear. Uh, but then when I look at the special ed percentage growth from year to year, it's very striking. And it tells me that there's a real, uh, it's a real imponderable. Because you have so many, uh, I said before, moving targets, there's so many things going on at once that how can you possibly plan ahead? By the same token, I agree with Charlie that 
if you're going to use a number like a 7% and those funds aren't being used, that we hold those funds someplace for a rainy day. And uh, maybe I'm not quoting you exactly, Charlie, but um, that, uh, you know, this, there may become a rainy day when suddenly this is, is up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one area we don't want to be cutting, cutting services. Mm -hmm. Well, in your reserve fund right now, there's 200000 from last year that we are going to put into the Special Education Sta Stabilization Fund at the town meeting now. Whether we can add some money to that, um, that remains to be seen. But, but at least, because we had to drain, you know, remember this, we had to drain 500000 out of it a couple years ago. So again, for that exact reason, it's just the volatility. So we're going to at least have that much in there and hopefully a little bit more. <coughs> okay, Peter. Um, on a different subject, subject, <clears throat> do you have any plans to put um, civic ed education back into the uh, curriculum? It's never you know, left. Given, given the uh, situation in presidential politics right now. I, I was surprised to hear that some school system, systems are not teaching civics or, or social studies or awareness of the world, and that's not been the case. Uh, we, we do that from elementary up. We have a we have a curriculum for each grade, and we certainly have um, in the in the middle school. We were talking about clusters earlier. It's organized around four core subjects. Social studies being one of the four. Uh, so they have as a core subject in the middle school and at the at the high school. Every student uh, takes um, social studies. In fact. When I was looking at um, our new director's, D D um, Danny Conklin's numbers for social studies, we actually have more kids taking social studies than we actually have students, which means that they're doubling up. We're seeing a doubling up in that field. So we have never stopped, and we consider it a very core part of our educational program. What, what about uh, um, the uh, student town meeting that you used to have. I, I don't think that's going on anymore. It, well, yes it is. As in third grade, uh, Mr. Hainer went again this year. We do have it. Is yeah. it going? Okay. Yeah. We do. Okay, Alan? Um, I, I just want to say something good about the, the special education programs. I remember about 10 years ago when we were looking at you know, double-digit growth almost every year uh, in sort of desperation. I asked the question, is there anything we can do about this or does it have to do with environmental issues or something? And the answer that I thought was great was intervention. And it started with reading intervention and math intervention. And, and if I look at the, uh, the, the chart on page 25 and you just sort of put a pen across it, it and, and I hope you can compare it apples and apples, it, it just appears that special education is growing more slowly than in general, so whether it's impacted by population growth or whatever, uh, without any real data, it seems to me that maybe those interventions, and as, as you know, you've said, those are doing a good job, and maybe uh, we can look forward to some time in the future when we have sufficient reserve, and if those programs continue to be successful, then we can start bending that seven percent curve down. Clearly, it has to be data driven. Have, have to agree on the right data. But on an entirely different subject, uh, about the uh, growth in the middle schools. I guess the question I have, if the decision's been made, if a decision would be made to not take back the Gibbs, would, uh, has there been a discussion then about putting a surplus and using it then to fund some of the other projects, selling it off uh, the way the Crosby was sold off? Um, if, in other words, if, if we don't need it now, what, what time in the future would be? If it, would, if it would be a bad choice, this year, when it has become a good choice, it seems like we sort of declared it surplus at that point. Would that, has that been discussed? Not as a task force per se, but it's certainly, I wouldn't say it's been discussed. Um, one of the things that we're learning, and we'll probably have much better information at the end of this month, at the end of April, is really what kinds of renovations that building needs. They're substantial. And if we don't, use that building for a school and invest in it in the renovations, then I think the town will be facing some decisions uh, around that. But I don't think it's been discussed, but I don't think any decision has been made. It's a little premature right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, as an honest neighbor, I'm sort of hoping we take back the Gibbs. 
Um, but uh, uh, but if we don't, then, then it just seems like it's an asset that can be liquidated. I'm sure that's going to be discussed. Can I can I just uh, say one more thing about uh, Peter's question? Um, I actually want to toot the horn of the middle school on this. We there's a, a competition, a national competition called National History Competition, and uh, our students. Uh, work independently on projects around history topics, which is part of the whole, is, uh, you have to understand your history as part of your civic education. And um, 13 of our teams, I think it's 13 or 14 of our teams, are moving on to state competition. Last year we had a team who went to nationals, but our team absolutely took every first, second, and third in every category in the competition just a couple weeks ago. So. We have a lot of students who are spending a lot of time on this topic, and I just um, want to give them a little plug in the, their advisors who work very hard. And we also have mock trials, a mock trial group at the high school uh, who also did very well in state competitions quite recently. So, sorry. I ha ha had to put that in there. Okay, Stephen. Thank you all. <coughs> um, can I have a question on the growth factor calculation for the Fiscal 17 on, on page 14. And, and my question is, and I, I understand there's been an increase from 25% to 35%. Last year, my understanding of the, the, the calculation was you took 25% of the fiscal 13 per pupil cost and multiplied that by the number of new students projected, which was 169, and that came up to the 530,000. On page nine of, of this handout tonight, you're projecting 196 students, and I'm wondering why 196 isn't where the 84 is. Oh, the 84 is the actual number of students. The per pupil, uh, the per pupil growth factor is added into the long range plan after we have actual students, and what I'm projecting is students ahead. So when we get the actual number in the fall. They will affect the budget for 18. Okay, so it, it's a timing incongruity. And, and was last year that different? Because I thought last year was what was being projected for the subsequent year, as opposed to what what actually happened. We projected higher for this year than we actually got, and so when we get the actual allocation, it's based on real numbers, not on projections. We use the projection numbers through the long range plan, but when the money actually comes to us in the next budget year, it's based on actual numbers. Okay. But, but was last year based on projections? Because it, no, it's always based on actual numbers. Okay, I did, I'm just looking at the, the funding summary statement from a year ago, and it, it talked about increase to the uh, increase to the fiscal 16 budget reflects growth from fiscal 15 of 169. But that's the actual you're talking about yes. from a year ago. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. And then just to comment on um, because we do have this discussion every year on on special ed costs and I, and I think you know rather than have the discussion tonight and, and, and it ha it's unfortunate I mean we should be having a discussion whether it's through our subcommittee whether we create a committee to sit down with you Diane because uh, Charlie makes valid points you make valid points in terms of what the history is but I, I look at this and, and we have six years of actual numbers now between what's in the, the end of the book and going back to fiscal 11, it comes out to 6.34% based on my calculation of, of, the, uh, of, of the actuals to actual and then 15 to 16 is actual 15 to projected 16 expenses. So just to get an understanding what's, what we're looking at, is it, is it actual to actual each year? Because when you calculate your 7%, you're really basing it off of budget numbers from year to year, aren't you? From, from 16 to 17, are you basing it off your budgeted special ed from the town appropriation? Because no, you don't I, know what the 16 actual when is. When I build the special ed budget, I build it without regard to the 7%. Right. I'm building what we think we need, which has created some controversy in prior years. Because I'm putting a budget in front of you that I think best represents what we're actually going to need. The 7% is part of the calculation that the stun and long range planning. And that's really, if, if there's to change to that, that's where that needs to happen. Right, but when you talk about the 7%, and when you have the summary, well, again, the summary on page 14 of, of the town's appropriation. Um, that's the product of long-range planning and the negotiations that go on there. Right, but that, that number bears no relationship to, to an actual expense. It's just a number that's Correct. been carried over from year to year. That's my point. Correct. And 
at the at the end of the book, in, 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 I'm happy to say it looks like the special ed expenses are actually going down this year between 100,000 or 600,000, depending on what number you use. Because I think originally last spring we the special ed number was 19.3 million, and as of September 8th, it was 19.8 million. So whatever that number is, it, it, it's coming down. But I still think it's a discussion we should have so that we don't have this dialogue every year. We, we should come into this meeting with the school committee knowing you know, we're, we're in agreement. These are the numbers over the last six years or eight years or whatever you have data for, and this is what the projection is. Because if the number needs to change up or down, we'll know. Well, and, but that's long range planning. No, I understand, but, but you still, with each passing year, you have the benefit now of, and in, in you, because of, of changes, you can't go back prior to fiscal 11 um, in terms of gathering the information Not without a lot of effort. And it's, it, it's, so if you use fiscal 11 as the starting point, mm -hmm. we now have six years of data, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it suggests a certain number, and, 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 you know, and maybe agree to a time period. Is it seven years? Is it 10 years? Whatever it is, so that we come in, we know what the formula is and, and you know, where, where additional funds may go, where, where shortfalls come out of it. Perhaps, um, you know, the 7% number was built over uh, assuming looking back like 10 years and saying this is the average of, of the 10 years and 7% and was, uh, was taken. I, I think it, uh, to change, it would probably need some negotiations uh, at a different level. But I think it could be thought that, you know, this year the budget's going up 7%, so that's not, a, that's not a problem. But let's say for next year, uh, uh, you're, you're going up 6% in special ed. I, I think it, it could be reasonable for us to expect that you're going to take that other 1% and do something uh, such as interventions, which would prevent the special education budget from going up. Or, as has been suggested by a couple of people, it's going to be put in reserve. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I, I think um, that's a reasonable expectation on our part, and I hope that, that you'll consider that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then be able to show us the case. Yep. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's, well, that, you, I think that's a great suggestion. In fact, uh, I think that that's what Mr. Foskett has said over time, is that you, you're putting some of this money into, into the general ed. And we, we, we do, you know, in, in years where we, we uh, have less money having to expend, you can do a little bit more in the way of support. Though, generally, when you set up your interventions, you pretty much set them up at the beginning of the year. You can add some tutoring as the year goes on, and we, if we can, we would like to. Um, we mentioned the reading program, which is really um, a marvelous program and very successful, but I have to say, we are not reaching all the students that we could. Um, we are not giving math intervention at the elementary school to all the students that need it. We're just not. We can't. We just don't have the personnel to do it. Are we doing a better <coughs> job than we used to? Yes. But there's a limit to what we can do. And as I started talking about our budget, we, we're doing a lot. We're getting tremendous results. But our per pupil is still under the state average. And that's, that's a fact. OK, I had a couple questions. One is, it's always, you know, I'm looking at the uh, page 19, and it has instructional special education, 19 million, total 62 million. So that's about, give or take, 30%. Mm -hmm. So 30% of your budget. And yet, I've always had this belief possibly wrong, that special education, you know, range is someplace between 15 and 20 percent. You, know, uh, you know, maybe if, it, if it's low, it's down around 16 or 17. You know, if it's high, it's around 18 or 19. It is, is that number somehow different than this number? Yes, that number is the percentage of students that receive special mm -hmm. education services. Okay. Okay, thank you. And, and, and that percentage has come down uh, a number of years ago. It was in the 20s in some schools. It's definitely below that. And I think it, it, our current is what, 16 percent? 16. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we just, I just wanted to turn this over. We got this letter from Arfa County Agricultural High School um, <coughs> saying that a student from Arlington has applied 
uh, to, for next year. And uh, so I was trying to figure out who to hand this off to. <laughs> This is vocational tuition. This is, so we should be sitting with the minivan bills. This is the out of out of county tuition rate of twenty two thousand one hundred and forty nine dollars. And so, since this is a student, you no longer have to educate. But that they're just like the minivan students. This should, should go be. to you. No, it should go to you <laughs> because they, you know they would be a minivan if minivan had the program that that student's seeking. So that's the only difference. We don't have the right to say no to them. And we have a student at, at RISTA, Cambridge Ridge and Latin, or Ridge School of Technical Arts in Cambridge. And we have someone, we have two at Essex, what used to be Essex Aggie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and all of those are just like Minuteman. If Minuteman had all of those programs, they'd be Minuteman students, but they have the right to seek that programming in other schools. And so I think it's really important for our long-term view of what we're spending on vocational education that we keep all those bills together in the same place with Minuteman. So how do we count have these been paid for in the past? Well, there haven't been that many in the past. Last, last fiscal year, Andrew Flanagan requested a transfer from you guys to pay it from the same place as we pay Miniman. And I think in the future, we should be paying them from the same place as we pay, pay Miniman because they are essentially Miniman like satellite locations. I think what you're trying to tell me is you don't want this. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is we paid it. No, no, that's next year. Oh, that's next year. I want, him to, I want him to keep that one. We're eating this year. We did. We paid this. Because the Warren article is written in such a way that it doesn't allow for this, and so I think that's something that we need to think about going forward. So this is, so I mean, this isn't bill. It's sort of a notification that somebody's applied. It doesn't even say whether somebody, whether they've accepted the student or not. So when, when, when Adam is not looking, I'll give it to him. Uh, okay, is there additional questions? Paul, John, Steve. So just one note, Adam. If, if the person is accepted and leaves, then the projection on how many students there will be next year will go down by one. So we'll save money in the, uh, in that. What I'm saying is that, that the eighth grader is not going to the high school, he's going here. We, we can discuss that later. <laughs> okay, uh, John, did you have another? Um, do, uh, this is a question that's a little bit afield from financial questions, but do we do a breakfast in the classroom in any of the schools, and in particular in the, uh, in, in the East? Um, the reason I ask the question is because I've become aware of uh, school districts, and even in relatively better uh, financial, uh, <coughs> financially more able towns, that there are schools who, where there are a lot of dis disadvantaged kids, and they're providing in some of those schools, and there's federal money available to do this, what's called breakfast in the classroom, where all the kids in the school, in the classroom, get some breakfast. Well, we're not giving breakfast to all the students, but we have a, we have a, you know, with the free and reduced lunch program, we provide breakfast as well as lunch. Well, and the breakfasts are available for students of needs to buy if they wish. I, I would just suggest that you might look at this. The reason, I mean, there's a, there's a saying that, Hungry kids eat teachers, and uh, breakfast is such an important thing for kids. And this has been reasonably successful, I've heard, well, quite successful in a number of disadvantaged communities. And it seems to me that in the East we might think about uh, something like this, and especially since there's federal money available to fund it. I have read the, about those studies too, and, and they have been successful. You have to have a certain threshold to be available to have the federal money available to do it across the board. Uh, we do not meet that threshold, but I will say that the um, whole town has to be at some threshold. Um, I thought they would be for an individual school. Well, we wouldn't. I don't think we'd meet the threshold either. But I, I could look into it. But I will say this: that at uh, one of our schools that you're probably referring to there is food available all day long. Um, and if there is fresh fruit, there is other types, all healthy snacks, and students come down when they feel hungry. I, and I think that one of the things that we have seen, and I wanna you know, give a shout out to Arlington Eats because they've just been terrific in providing <coughs> um, uh, ba bags of food to go home at night and certainly over the weekend. And there's now a summer program as well in which um, people can come in and have lunch and take food. One thing that has, we have seen is that 
student behavior issues have gone down and performance is going up. And it does have an effect. And so in, in many cases, you know, the correlation is strong between kids that are, have enough to eat and their ability to attend to what's going on in school. Yeah, I'll just make one yeah. final statement, and that's that the kids who are provided in this way stand out from the others, whereas if it's everybody getting breakfast in the yes. classroom, then there's no distinction. Yes, and that's, that, that's one of the advantages. I think, I, I, I can look at it again, have our director of food service look at it, um, but when we did at one point, we weren't at the threshold we would be eligible for that money. And that's exactly why they do it. They don't want, the, they don't want any distinction between, uh, between students. But with it available to every student in the school, um, <coughs> I think that line has somewhat blurred. Another thing that we have done too, and you should be aware of, kids now, if they have a number. See, when you go to check out, nobody knows whether you have your free and reduced or you're getting paid, I think, because you basically all did the same thing. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Stephen? Yeah, you have just a quick question in, in, in light of the, the unfortunate uh, incidents at the high school with the, the, the hoax, the, the threats and everything. Has there been any discussion either through facilities or any further right, identification of, of the need for, for more security at the, just in terms of you know, locking doors and additional videos, are there, are there any amounts in the budget that, that may um, cover that situation, in particular at the high school, because it, it just never ceases to amaze me how, you know, how many doors are out there and how, and for how easy it is to get into that building. And, and I'm just wondering if that, that is well, something well, Some people say something is hard to get in that building. I, I know there's been people that are sitting here that have been locked out. Um, but we try very hard to do that. One of the things is just <coughs> there are so many doors. <coughs> Sometimes what a student will do, especially if it's a door in a more obscure area, they'll go out and they'll put something in there to keep it open. But we're constantly in vigilance about that. We're, we're, we're doing some upgrade on hardware. In fact, we have... Um, uh, Quite a bit of money, not quite a bit. I, I forget exactly. It's ten, in the tens of thousands. I think maybe sixty thousand is going to be available to change hardware uh, because what's happened over time is they people, and I don't think it's always students too. They they jimmy the doors in such a way that they can always sort of just kick it and it'll open. So we're changing we're changing those. We're, we we I know we're looking at greater greater surveillance cameras that have better even re, better resolution than we have right now. Um, we have a, a process at the high school where students, people have to check in and get badges. And in fact, one of the things we're thinking of investing in next year, we're getting quotes on, is a machine where a lot of the high schools have where you, you give your driver's license and you get, the, what you get back is a, is a, is actually a picture ID to go around rather than just a filled out. So we're working on all the time. These particular hoaxes had really nothing to do with the physical security of the building. This was um, the FBI is working on it, so I, I really don't know where the status of the investigations. This was had to do with people calling in um, and leaving these messages that you have to take seriously. No, no, I, I understand. I was offline. I just think it gives people more peace of mind if if there is you know some some additional you know. Mm -hmm. safeguards that are being thought about. I'm glad to hear oh, that it sounds like there, there is. I will so. say, and it, I, I was actually out at Minuteman this morning on another issue, and they have that system where you turn in your uh, mm -hmm. your license, so it's, it's mm -hmm. something that uh, you know, doesn't look like it um, takes up much room, and hopefully it's something yeah. that can be done. And of course, half the time, if you knock at the door, the student will let you in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> They're a little trusting, too trusting at times. But we've been working on that one too, you know. But there are so many doors, and of course, as we look at the high school um, in the next phase, the next going down the road in terms of renovation, big build, we have to look at that issue in terms of the doors that are available uh, for supervision. Okay, Peter. I, I've got a simple question. What's F O S S science? <coughs> Full option science. Full, full option? Full option science system. Thank you. Okay, Brian. 
on page 14 on the growth factor, um, I'm trying to understand the per pupil cost of 13085 because so if you multiply it by the student population, you get $70 million. Sorry? If you take the per pupil cost for Arlington at 13085 multiply that, that shifts every year, you realize. And so we're using the most current per pupil, so if you go back in time, there would be different numbers? But if, if you multiply it by today's population, you get, no. 70, you get 70 million. Uh, yeah, but Which, that... That's but, in excess of the total budget. But you have to remember that from the state, per pupil also includes some degree of capital costs and it includes some um, benefits. The benefits for the school department, which are significant, reside in the town budget, not in the school budget. Right, which means they shouldn't be included here, I wouldn't think. No, they're part of per pupil. No, I understand, but if you're looking for the increases, we're already paying for the increases for the um, human resources, which would be health insurance, pension costs, they're all through the town budget. So wouldn't this number be reduced by that percentage? Well, you're only giving formally 25, now 35% of that number anyway. Well, regardless of what the number is, I mean, isn't that correct? I don't understand. Well, I mean, if you take the number of students in the population, in the student population, which you have is 5410, if you just simply multiply it by this cost, the number comes out to $70 million and change. It's in excess of what you have in the school budget. I'm presuming it's because of the human resources cost, which is health insurance and pension. But those budgets are funded and they're increased and we fund them separately. So that portion should be reduced from this number because we're already paying for it, the increase in that. That's why it's 35%. I'm sorry? It's 35% so that 65% of the costs are excluded. I understand. The fixed costs for the buildings and the <coughs> benefits, et cetera. This 35% is meant to address the variable cost of students coming into the system. Okay. Okay. Alan? Well, I guess maybe, maybe to turn that around, just to clarify it, um, where did the 13,000, what was the calculation that ended up with 13,000? That comes from the state, the end of the year report, where the state takes um, school related expenditures from both town and school, mm -hmm. and it normalizes it so you can compare apples to apples on a statewide basis. Okay. And that seemed like a good metric. Mm -hmm. You know, what is, a, what is a district spending on school education? And this is ours, and you know it's mm -hmm. below the state average. It just it was a metric. Mm -hmm. You know you could drive yourself to madness kind of trying to come up with what does it cost to educate a kid, and we decided not to and just go for some low hanging fruit, which was the per pupil cost. Great, thank you. I just wanted to clarify it for the millions of viewers. <laughs> and that way, you know, we have a state a number that's generated by somebody else, right? You know, who has no stake in it. So it seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Okay, other questions. Okay, um, would, would any of the uh, school committee members have any comments they'd like to make uh, on this? Okay, that's great. Um, I think that uh, you've made a, a great presentation. Uh, we'd like to thank you very much for coming and uh, let you know how it turns out. Okay, uh, the school department uh, <coughs> and the man town manager uh, are recommending uh, an appropriation from the town for the school budget of 
57,001,333. What is the will of the committee? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion. Charlie? Yes. <clears throat> I'd like to make a, make a comment here. Uh, and Steve, I disagree with your point before. Uh, this is not a coronation. This is a review of this budget. In, when I see a million or more dollars that's not justified, in my mind, not explained fully, I'm going to talk about it. And I don't see any reason why we shouldn't talk about it. I, I don't either. I, I didn't say you shouldn't talk about it. You suggested that we should settle this at well, some other venue. Well, well, no. What I'm suggesting, Charlie, is, it, and, and I agree with a lot of the points you make, okay, but, but we know the budget's been voted by the school committee. The number has been um, brought forward by the manager as well, okay? We're not going to change that number tonight. And, and rather than have this discussion here, and, and I'm, I, I understand your frustration, but I, I think better to do it in advance of this meeting next year because now you've done it for 20 years and, and you're still not satisfied. So maybe we should try something else. No, actually, I've only done it for five years. Okay. And, and I, I started doing it when she threw the last document away, when that document <coughs> demonstrated that the, the, the uh, special education costs were constant or going down. And she stood right in front of us. And she gave us the document two days before. She stood in front of us and threw it away. And I'm pointing out now that we've got four or five years of, uh, or actually it's three or four years of data here that says the same thing. And they refuse to recognize it. And, and what my point is that this money, sh if it's not being spent on special education, should be put in a reserve so that we don't hear all the time that, oh, we've got four more special students this year and it's costing so much money, they should have the reserve there. Right. I, I agree with you. Okay. In that case, uh, I'd like to make an amendment to it that would ask the uh, Finance Committee School Subcommittee of uh, Dick, Dean, Rohit, uh, you just have the, your, your three, don't you, Dick? Yeah. Okay. That next year, because uh, you guys go to the budget subcommittees of the school committee, uh, that you encourage as much as possible that if the special education budget is going to be less than 7%, that either that money, uh, the difference, goes into reserve or spent on funds that will specifically keep the special education down. Uh, and I guess that would be, uh, you know, prevention type programs, but that they show that. Um, so I offer that. John? If I may comment, because I, I basically agree with Charlie. And the reason that we probably ought to have the 7% this year is because of what Dean pointed out, which is the increase in population. And it seems to me that the growth factor of just that 7% or something like that evaluated over, over past history ought to as well account for increases or decreases in population. So I, I think there ought to be a different kind of a, if I may say, the, a different kind of calculation that includes what you pointed out. Because the budget makes more sense when I realize that we have this increase in population which amounts to like 3% a year. Stephen? No, and, and I think that's a factor, but I, I think last year, if, it, if, if the expense projections come in as a forecast, okay, and we know enrollment's going up, the, the increase between 15 and 16 will be 2.85%, and that's with probably the largest growth that we've seen in the past four or five years. So this, that's it may not necessarily be a direct correlation between enrollment and, and and, and special ed. But one other thing, Charlie, they, they sent you frustration, but last year I didn't even want to vote the budget because of this issue on the 7%, and, and it got put forward to this year. So that's why I suggest, okay, it hasn't been working asking every single year. And, and I take your suggestion a step further, Alan, and, and, and say, suggest before we close down for the year, we at least have an agreement with the school department as to what the actual increase is in special ed since fiscal 11. So. So at least that's agreed upon, because that seems to be the, the furthest back we can go to based on what Diane's saying and the information that she has. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. Um, Brian? I'm going back to these, um, the regular gen ed. I thought it was, that was going to be a 3.5% increase per year. How did it end up at 5.09? 
The, um, the, there were three parts of this. One was the increase in the regular education budget, which is three and a half. The other was the increase in the special ed age, which was seven. And then about two or three years ago, maybe more, uh, long range planning, uh, because this was the, you know, the school right, enrollment the was based on, uh, was saying we, we need some relief because of the school enrollment. And so the formula that was determined was 25% times the per pupil uh, average spending as determined by the state times the last year's actual increase in enrollment. And, uh, but those numbers know. are calculated separately on this sheet, on this page 14. Yeah, they are. Uh, so the gen ed cost is what I've just, just that one line item. So it doesn't include the special ed or the increase factor. No, but it includes the, it includes the growth factor. The 973.524 is in the increase of 1,758,662. Awesome. Okay, call this wasn't the best description. You'll see it in the long range planning uh, 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 calculation that does that. And so uh, it, the number was increased from 25% to 35%. Okay, I, I, I'm understanding. Yeah. More, more uh, little blue blue economics. <laughs> the growth factor rolls yeah. up. I, got, I, I see what's going on. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other discussion? Paul. This was the, I've never heard a discussion of how it changed from 25% to 35%. The, uh, the schools came in this year uh, to long range planning looking for an increase of about 11.4% in their budget. Uh, and, and so going back and forth and back and forth, uh, several of us thought that was way out of line uh, with, with what the town could afford, uh, but also with some recognition that uh, the, uh, they, they had some fairly strong needs uh, that, you know, the compromise was to go from 25% of per pupil cost to 35% of per pupil cost uh, and to make that retroactive back a couple of years. Um, now, by the way, I, I, I want to keep repeating this so everybody knows, if the, per if the enrollment goes down next year, their budget gets adjusted down by that, by that amount. So uh, I, I don't expect that will happen, but at some point, you know, these numbers change. Uh, so, so that was the, uh, um, to go to 35% was sort of my compromise. Uh, the manager worked it back and forth uh, and with the superintendent and then the superintendent with the school committee and uh, his recommendation was we do 35% but we make it retroactive. So I gave him, you know, an extra push of cash this year and then next year uh, it'd be, it'd only be one year, obviously, 35% times the enrollment increase, whatever that, that is. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's a reasonable number. Uh, you know, they are correct. They're below the state average in per pupil spending. Um, they seem to do a pretty good job with it. Um, I think that, uh, you know, pushing them, uh, like was discussed here, to use any difference, you know, obviously if it's over 7%, they get to eat it. If it's under 7%, try to spend the money in such a way to, to uh, prevent it from going over 7% in the future uh, is uh, what I was suggesting. Okay, any further discussion? Alan? I, just, I think the original request for growth factor was 75% of the per pupil cost it's in the first true. meetings. <laughs> And as you're saying, if it goes over 7%, they should eat it. If, no, that should come out of the reserve fund. It should be all this money that should be accumulating in the reserve fund, that's where an exit for 7% should come yeah. from, not out of general. By the way, I did talk to the superintendent about the, uh, actually, email. Nobody ever talks anymore. Uh, and they'll probably put in a request for the 200000 uh, We can't transfer the 200000 directly into the special education civilization fund. Uh, it has to, we have to uh, transfer it to the school budget and then the school department asks the town meeting to transfer 200,000 plus whatever that else they can come up with into the special education stabilization fund. So 
uh, um, I'll try to get a, actually Dick, could you try to get a, a letter from them uh, asking for the $200,000 transfer? Mm -hmm. Okay, any further discussion on the, uh, on the school budget? Okay, uh, did anybody second? Second. I did. My, my, second. Okay, good. Okay, so motion's been made and seconded for 57001333 uh, with the proviso that the uh, Finance Committee Special uh, School <coughs> Subcommittee uh, work with the uh, School Committee Budget Subcommittee to make sure that uh, if the special education is going up less than 7%, that that money either be set aside in reserve or set aside specifically to prevent the increase in special education. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, uh, in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Okay, Dick, could you let them know of our? Yeah. Our, okay, it is 924, so we can get some other things done. Uh, Uh, John, do you think you could do the uh, rank in the? Uh... Okay. Uh, Brian. Four. Oh wait a minute. I'm sorry. It's side. David. I, I think we can do the election budget. Okay. So let's go to the election budget. Page 27. Yep. I'm passing out the revised budget. Okay. The election uh, budget, as you notice uh, on the handouts I gave, I also gave out a page for the adjustments that we made on the selection budget uh, that we already voted on for our records. Uh, they re reduced the election total budget now to 1,400, 1,042,650. <coughs> if you go up the line, 5,100 selling wages. The, that primarily is the cost of the police detail as well as public works for the uh, election. And um, just to give you an example, we have 10 voting precincts, uh, 10 voting polls, 21 precincts. And it takes approximately 20 plus police officers for the day. And the salaries are calculated for the police officers on that day. Um, it's time and a half the individual officers <coughs> rate. So if you had a patrolman, it would be one rate. If you had a patrolman with education centers, it would be another. If you had a sergeant, same thing, lieutenant, captain. Okay, I'm sorry, that's under 5219? No, it's 5100 salary. 5100 salaries and wages, okay. In addition, it's the public works people that um, prior to the uh, voting day. Uh, that, really, that money, they go around and set up all the, uh, all the material. They deliver all the material needed for that, for that uh, voting election. And uh, now if, we, if you move down to 52808 rental buildings, that's the um, Park Ave Congregational Church that is rented for a uh, precinct 20. Um, 5219 election officers, poll workers, uh, salaries. As we know, um, there was an increase voted um, for the voucher payment on, on, on the individual employees that worked that day. There's approximately 168 workers that worked the um, election polls on election day. And it's broken down to its sum. Um, a warden, a clerk, 
This is based upon one of the cases. A, a warden, a clerk, four tellers or inspectors, and two people that relieve them for both lunch and uh, dinner. So for our 21 precincts, there's 168 people. Just, just working the polls. Um, with the others off supplies, other purchase services. Um, other purchase services, um, the 52 of 36, that includes the um, voting machines. And what happens there is they have to be uh, programmed for every election, they're, they're whatever's on the ballot. And uh, what's happening with, with these machines, and it's going to come up eventually, they no longer make that model voting machine. And they're running, it's, it's harder and harder to obtain parts that should one of those machines break down. So at some point, they're going to have to come in and uh, make a capital request for new voting machines. And also, you'll notice that um, early voting, um, there's the $10,000 for early voting. And what that is, um, it's really up, in, it's in flux right now. Um, what I mean by that is, they haven't been officially told from the Secretary of State on what they're supposed to do for this early election, other than they have to have it. And it varies from, from a discussion of having one voting poll, two voting polls, or maybe three voting polls. That's one discussion. Uh, recently, there's been a discussion that perhaps maybe they might have a 10-day period where you can, in a 10-day period, and it has to be a month before the general election where you can go and uh, vote in that 10-day period. It's very similar to the, uh, like a voting absentee ballot, uh, but the, uh, so they don't know uh, what they're going to end up doing. They're going to have one voting poll, two voting polls, three voting polls, they're going to have a 10 day period. They haven't, they haven't had anything from the state. Uh, I've checked both with the clerk's office and also the selectman's office. So they put a $10,000 into it. They know they're going to have to have it. They put that in. And then, Otherwise unclassified, if you notice that that was 1,000, they uh, decided not to include that. The, um, um, now, the, ironically, the, this is based upon three elections, but there might be a fourth election. And that depends upon whether uh, our financial situation, depending upon whether we're going to cycle another side, whether they have a, uh, an override, get exclusion, or whatnot. So that, that could be coming down the pike. In addition, they received, um, th there is somewhat of a refund on certain elections from the state, and they, they did receive recently um, $7,006. <coughs> but that's, um, they're holding that right now to, to see what um, is required, and, and maybe the, if we're going to have a special election. And they're also waiting for another reimbursement as well. And that goes to the treasurer first and then back to to the selectman's election in the selectman's office. Did we spend, I assume that we spent only for election yes. related expenditures. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so that's it. That's the adjustments that, that were made um, on the election salaries and, and budget. So I recommend that we um, go for $142,650 as presented. Okay. Uh, questions? Charlie? Dave. Um, the 44,430 for the uh, salaries and wages for yes. 5,100. Um, so the police, DPW, et cetera, these are people already working for the town. Is, is that, is those funds subtracted from the other departments? I believe what, I believe what happens is the, it's, it, how they calculate this is after the election because you don't know ahead of time what, uh, who the office is going to be for and what rank they're going to be. So that then they, they grade bill it. They grade bill it. So, so it essentially is subtracted. Right. So, so we're counting it as an increase in the budget, but it's actually not an increase in the budget. Right. Now, they must have to bring police officers in on overtime because... Every, if, every, every police officer working the polls. What happens is the, the, the officer working a given poll, well, you have cut it down now. Let's say, for instance, you have three voting polls in one location. We will have one officer come in one half hour before the polls open. Like in the last election, they had to be there at 6.30. That officer stays from 6.30 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That officer is relieved at 4 o'clock. The next officer comes in and stays to closing, but is not relieved of their duty until they 
come to the clerk's office and be put, put by the operations captain in charge of the detail. Yeah. So that's but, where you get the. Uh, but you wouldn't. Would you use your sector officers to do poll watching? I mean, don't they have other duties? No, you wouldn't. Uh, the, the sector officers. The only time a sector officer would be at a poll um, if there's a call for assistance or something like that. Okay, so, so this must all be overtime. It's all overtime. It's, 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 and it's based upon, it, there's a difference in detail rates. If one was working for, say, a utility on Mass Ave, that's, that's a, what they call an outside detail rate. Inside, working for the town, it's time and a half the individual officers rate, and that's where it can vary from one officer to another, all the way up okay. to the captain. Okay, so it is an actual increase in expense. Yeah. yeah. So, and plus, plus built in, there's also um, with this contractual agreements for the next three years. Is it? That's part of it too. Okay. Uh, Alan. I just when you mentioned new voting machines, I wanted to make sure that capital planning is aware of. Local startup named ClearVote, which is making excellent voting machines from generic off-the-shelf components at a much reduced cost. So, but um, well, maybe it's not capital in. <laughs> maybe, it's uh, um, maybe it's just software. Uh, but uh, this, so the, the budget we're voting here is more than eighty thousand less than the original. So I guess we, I guess you've earned your pay. I um, might pay it. And, and also, yeah, but but I'm just sort of wondering. You know what? What happened between the two hundred and twenty-two thousand and the hundred and forty-two thousand? Uh, let's say times three. What happened was they took the, all this and they took the last election last year and they went times three. And you, you, you got the who, who, who is they? Uh, I will not the say. Computer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was just a, it was a. a just a tactical error that, that has been uh, rectified. Did you say tactical error or typographical error? Ty typographical. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, all this stuff is generated off Munis uh, with a brand new unit using Munis for the operation of this budget. Remember, we didn't have Sandy here until the end of January, so I, I, I think probably mistakes like this happen. We're doing our job. Okay, Paul. Well, I, I, I would say that the, um, the in the selectman's office, along with the uh, comptroller's office, they know a lot more about the elections than, than they once did. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as we caught it, <laughs> Paul. Um, the 2017 fiscal year 2017, they're the same number of elections as in fiscal year 2015. Unless there's an extra election. Right, there was three, three. three. And it was possibly four, and, and then we also got this, uh, what they call early, early election voting. Um, so looking at line 5219 and the 2015 actual of the 2017 request, that's a significant increase for the same number of elections. Right, also remember there was an increase in this, in this uh, Hourly rate of and, and what was that increase? This is for the poll workers, right? Poll workers. Um, okay. It's it's now the water receives uh, one sixty. No, I'm sorry, one seventy five. The clerk receives one fifty. The uh, inspectors, I uh, believe, is 120, and the uh, uh, relief workers did not, there was no increase in the relief workers. Uh, That's what it is now. What was it before? It was 160, it was 160 for a warden, and it was one, I think 130 for the, for the clerk. And I believe the uh, inspectors, it was $100. Or 100, something like that. Wait, wait a minute. Did you say 16 or 15? 16, we had two 17. Uh, 15 and 17. 2015 and 2017. I'm looking at those two numbers. Yeah, right. Because yeah. And, so and the numbers you came up with sound like a 20% increase in the, in the total cost of one polling place? Well, election workers, 
$885 times 10 equals $895 times, the times 10 is each warden is also paid a $10 a stipend for the use of the cell phone because of all these places there are no, okay. but to, but now, for, it equals for, out to be 21 times uh, 18795 and, and what was it the last time? I don't know. Last time what? In 2015, okay. what was the we the can rate? It up for right, you, what Paul. was the cost for one polling for one? Precinct? All I can tell you is this: it was uh, a, a warden gets um, last last time a warden would get one. I'm sorry, the warden got 150 plus ten dollars. That's 160. The clerk would get 130, and the uh, Tellers would get 100, and the um, the relief workers would get 10. dollars What is what does the teller get this year? I, I believe the teller gets. Um, um, I, I'm not sure if it's 110 or, or 120. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, the the total difference. He's trying it's to like get less to, than 20 percent. He's trying to get to housing. Why is there a 50 percent increase? Right. It's, there's the, the increase is 50 percent, but the pay rate looks like it went up by about 20 percent. It did. It's not. not um, Are there more people? Well, there's 168 times. It's, it's 21 I mean, it's times. Not it's, relative, not, no, relative it's the same to number 2000. of people in 2017 as 2015. <clears throat> And they the overall rates. prices, the old rate Probably went so. up 20 percent, so the budget should go up 20 percent. And instead, it's going up 15, more than 50 percent. They got a raise. They got a raise. The raise is about 20 percent. You got it. Yeah. Then how can the, if the raise is 20 percent? How can the total cost go up 50 percent? Well, are you looking at the bottom line or I'm just the bottom, the bottom line? line. I, I would the, like the bottom line, but I don't. I don't know the bottom line. I think, I think there were big bonuses. He was looking at, at line number 5219. That's what he was looking right. at. Yeah. Well, there is a 7,000 is for purchase services, one. which is you know, the polling machines. There's uh, all I'm looking at is that yeah. one line, right, right. 5219. <laughs> 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 who, who, who has those numbers that Paul could get them from? The, the, the clerk's office? Or? They're right in the selectman's office. The, the selectman office takes care of the right, workers, right. not the clerk's office. Right, right. Clerk's so office. Right. Complete different yeah. thing. Payroll would probably yeah. also. And um, good luck. Yeah. Have you talked to payroll? They should be getting W-2s. No. Actually, no. You, or you know, the increase from 15 yeah. to 16. It comes out of a vulture account. It's not a payroll account. The controller would be. It comes out of the treasuries. Okay, so that specific thing you're looking at, going from thirty-five thousand to fifty-six thousand right. under twenty-two nineteen, is what you'd like some more detail on. Right. I mean, because yeah. it's it's the same number of elections. There was only two elections in, in two thousand fifteen. Two. There should have been three. The same as two thousand seventeen. Which was calendar two, twenty fourteen. Primary. Fifteen, you would have had a prime, a state primary, and a state general. And, and then the town, a uh, and town the election. So you'd have three. Um, and actually, it was an increase from 15 to 16 because you have an increase in the, in the wages of, or, of 2,000, but you also have a drop of from three elections to two in elections. In 2016, there are three elections because of the presidential primary. In 16, yeah. 16 would be a town election. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. It's only two. You're it's right. only two. It's, it's the town, town election and the primary. The presidential primary. Right. And the year before it was three because right. you had the town plus two states. Right. So it's it's consistent from 2016 to 2017. The number is consistent. It's about you know one election more, but but from 2015 to 2016. Um, so I guess I should look go back and look at the minutes from you last year and see what the explanation was so if, last year. I mean, if you round it, if if uh, two elections there, so call it 40,000, that means elect 20,000 per election. Then fifty-six thousand. Right. It's it's exactly it is, it is consistent. Yeah. The, the question could have been asked the year before. Right. And that's yeah. I'll, I'll go back and look at the minutes from last year and see okay. if there was an explanation. Okay. Other questions. Okay, David, are you recommending one forty-two six fifty? Yes. Second. Your second. Okay. 
Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? What's the date today? Three? 16. 16. 16. Okay, does that do it for you, David? Yes. Okay. Uh, Brian, do you have retirement yet? I don't do retirement. You don't do retirement? No. Yes. Uh, sure. Insurance. Sure. No, they we're meeting with them on the 23rd, but then next Wednesday. Yeah, we meet next Wednesday morning. Okay, so you meet with them. Uh, are there any other budgets to present? Okay, Grant, do you have the uh, just those two Warren articles by chance? Yeah, I do. Okay, why don't we vote those two Warren articles then? So I have the notes from it. Now I just have to find which two other ones they are. The committee can move out there. The committees are 44. Yeah, 44. Okay, article 41 is the sewer. Um, okay, sewer. The total amount, um, they're, they're financing uh, 800000 from um, MRWARA loans, and uh, they're asking for uh, uh, 100 cash for a total of 900000 900000 the total sewer repairs, they're only asking for uh, Okay, so we're, they're authorized. They want an eight hundred thousand dollar loan and a hundred thousand in cash. Yeah. What, why would they ask for cash for from the town meeting? Well, I think cash is coming from the budget. From the enterprise yeah, fund. That's right. Oh, okay. So we don't worry about that. Right. Because that will take place in the budget. Okay. So they're looking for an eight hundred thousand dollar NWRA loan under Article Forty One, which is sewer. That's correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, for those new people, um, this is where the NWRA overcharges us and then loans us our money back for free uh, at no interest. But uh, these are interest free loans. We have to do it in separate articles. We can't do it under the capital budget. Uh, and uh, usually, what, it's a five year loan, uh, and then we, we pay them back through the budget. Um, so we, this is authorizing the borrowing. Then the treasurer goes out and borrows it, and then we pay it back, debt service, through the uh, enterprise budget. Okay, any questions? And our ratings are so good, maybe we could act like Japan and charge them to lend us money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do I have a motion? So, so Okay, seconded. Second. Okay, all those in favor of $800,000, authorizing an $800,000 NWRA interest-free loan for sewer, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, favorable action. Unanimous. 3, 16, 16. Okay, and then how about the Article 42, which is water? Water, and again, they're using cash, 100 days cash in the budget, so they're asking for approved for an MRA loan of 1.1 million. Okay, so a 1.1 million NWRA loan for water. Are there any questions or discussion? Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, uh, any further? Okay, all those in favor of authorizing a $1.1 million NWRA interest-free loan for water mains, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. 3, 16, 16. Okay, let's just, we've had the position reclassifications are done, budgets we're working on, capital budget we get next week. Um, do you have any rescissions too? Then I'll go with that? Yes. Okay, we'll do it. Uh, 
appropriation, oh, the review we've done, 39 we've done, 40 we've done, 41, 42 we've done, uh, 43 is the, uh, we'll hear that next week on Minuteman. Um, I suppose, every, I assume everybody got the uh, 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 electronic copies from Stephen on the uh, Minuteman budget. By the way, I got one that was okay and one that said warning virus. Is it, that, that was a, a PowerPoint presentation on the new building, so I can... Um, if you can uh, PDF it and send it yeah, out. okay. For those of us with ancient okay. Microsoft. Okay. Um, committees and commissions. Um, we haven't really voted those, but why don't I put those in a different format and we'll do those later. ATEC is coming back in on a week from Monday um, uh, with a revised or, or uh, uh, presentation. Alan, you've been working with them on that? Okay, good. Okay, town celebrations and town miscellaneous. I'll, I'll put together so we can vote that uh, maybe next week sometime if we have time. Water bodies, we've 48's done, uh, 47's done, 48's done. Uh, 49. I move favorable action. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. This is where we authorize them uh, for the new people. Uh, if uh, if you're, a, uh, you know, you start off at 80% and then gradually you're going to go down compared to it, this is to prevent people from going below 50%. Uh, they have to uh, have been a 25 year town employee. Uh, and there's a couple other provisions which prevent people from taking advantage, uh, but it's an authorization to keep people from falling too far. Um, so moved and seconded for favorable action. Any questions? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. 316.16. Uh, okay, the OPEB Trust. Um, Can you do that next Monday? Okay, that would be fine because we, I, I assume the manager doesn't have any extra money to throw in, so it'll just no. be the usual cast of characters. Have, we, have the, we have the number, but I just don't have it on my fingertips. So. Okay. Um, Long term stabilization 51, we've already voted. Um, overlay reserve. Do you know if the assessors have released? That. Actually, is it's a, we had a f funny conversation, right, with the assessor on that. He uh, didn't know what the number was because the board of assessors was discussing it with the town manager. So I guess the town manager is going to make that recommendation. Okay. So ask manager. Okay. The special education stabilization fund. Uh, we might hold on that to. Uh, because they might have, you know, basically, they, um, Dick, you'll get us the letter for the transfer of the 200000 there, and then they'll ask town meeting to put that back, but they might have some more money, uh, you know, in there. Um, funds and cemetery? Mon on, Monday. Monday, okay. Now, use of free cash. It could. Alan, what's the free cash number? I'm sorry, four million? Okay, four million five three seven two nine nine. Yeah, four million five hundred and thirty seven two hundred and ninety nine. Okay. Every year what we've done is is we take the authorized or the uh, certified free cash, we use half into the budgets, roll half into into the following year. Uh, this year, because of various elements, the free cash was higher than usual. Um, so half of the certified free cash is $4,537,299. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, second? Okay, so this is the amount that will authorize the assessors to use in the setting of the tax rate, which basically means we just sort of use it for the whole appropriation. The balance of it will roll into free cash for next year. Uh, any questions or discussion? 
Okay, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. 316.16. Uh, fiscal stabilization fund, that'll be the last one we do. Basically, that's our balancing. Um, community preservation. Gosh. Uh, you're our representative on the CPA. Apparently, uh, yeah, I'm also the capital planning committee's representative. Right? Somehow that. So I'm going to be going to that meeting on Monday the 28th. Okay. And I have no idea what what we're going to be recommending. Yeah. I sort of made an issue that they're not meeting enough. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how many times, you know, they've met. Um, now the the, the C, our advice our role is is an advisory. In other words, usually we've had three bodies which report to town meeting: redevelopment board, board of selectmen, and the finance committee. With this CPA, we have a fourth body that reports directly to it. So the recommendation that will be before town meeting will be the recommendation of the CPA. Um, however, you know we could always chime in if we don't like what they're doing. Um, but we got to hear from them. Um, so if you could, Charlie, get, give some sense of, I mean, if, uh, when they might be willing to make a make a presentation to us. Okay, I'll ask them. Okay, thank you. Uh, resolution for community preservation, and then the last two are resolutions that the selectmen will be doing. Okay, that moves us along. 9.55, okay, we got pretty close to the, uh, uh, to do this. So next week, meeting on Monday and, uh, and Wednesday, we'll be hearing the capital budget on Monday. We'll be hearing the Minuteman on uh, Wednesday. Uh, Minuteman, the selectmen have set aside a task force to study the, you know, Minuteman building. Uh, uh, and it, it's sort of comprised of the people who have sort of been meeting anyway on it. Um, the agreement's done. Now we have to get into the, uh, whether we really want this budget or this uh, building or not. And uh, my, my guess is, and Stephen, uh, oh, you met with him today, right? Yes. Had he, had he said, now they're gonna vote, or have they already voted? Um, they, they voted last, Tuesday night to, to um, bond, uh, they, they had some sort of debt held on this. 144 million, I, I, I don't know. $500,000. Yeah. They, they so the, so the clock's ticking, we have 60 days. Okay, so uh, there's, there's 60 days for somebody to vote no. The minute somebody votes no, they will, put, they will go directly to the uh, referendum question in all 16 towns. Right. So, uh, Stephen, could you just sort of touch bases and find out, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, well, he'll probably actually know next Wednesday, but try to keep track of if anybody's voted no um, on it. Because I think, I think one of the towns actually meets this month. Yeah, well, I, th I think Lincoln meets this weekend. Even though they'll be withdrawing, they still have to vote. They still have, they to, still vote. have to vote. Uh, on that, so uh, yeah, if you can keep track of that and see what we're doing. And, and Alan, just one credit that people want to leave, but he has the two. He had the two handouts that I sent to everybody, and I'll just send the PowerPoint presentation. He also had a schedule of projected debt service, and I said to him, "There's going to be plenty of time to talk about that after our subcommittee meets." I, I don't know if that's something that would. Yeah. It's it's a hypothetical. I mean, he, he can present it, but it, it just feels okay. like it's maybe not something that he needs to address next Wednesday. Well, one issue that we'll need to to know a little bit about fairly soon is, um, yeah, when will the first debt service payments? Is he going to go out and bond the whole thing right now because interest rates are, are so ridiculously low, or is he going to ban it out and and as they need it and then bond it a couple years down the road? Um, this will be, we really need to know that as soon as possible because if this passes, we'll need a debt exclusion. Otherwise, we're gonna have a million seven in debt service hit our budget, and we just need to have a sense of when is that gonna hit our budget. And that'll tell us when we need to have the debt exclusion. So, uh, 
If you have a chance to talk to him about his thoughts on that, that would be that would be important. All right. Paul? Uh, two questions. One is what we put to town meeting, can it be um, contingent upon a debt exclusion? Can we say yes if the town approves a debt exclusion? No. Uh, I, I, okay, the, Charlie? No, no, the last no, no we, we, we have to, we have, if we don't do anything, we don't do anything, they go forward. We have to vote no to stop it. So you, you, you can't vote a contingent no. Okay. It, it's, it's really right. difficult. Me? You're still subject to the referendum, even if you don't know. Right? That's right, you're still yeah. subject to the referendum. Yeah, and then, and it's a special election. It, it's only open, what, eight hours or something? It, when most town elections are open like 12 or 13. And I don't know if we could put a debt exclusion on that ballot anyway. And even if we could, it might not be the best timing to do it, so. so my, my other question is, was, are we allowed to put a debt exclusion on the September primary ballot or the November state ballot? Just, um, just to save money on elections. Well, we won't have a state election this year. Or are you talking the well, year after? November. November. No, November. Yes, we could put a, uh, I think we could put a debt exclusion on the November ballot. We would have to have it to the uh, Secretary of State by like early August or something like that um, on there. John? Does anybody have any idea how they would, how they would uh, determine interest rates for a loan to the Minuteman School? Would it be some aggregation of the of what individual towns would pay, for instance? Okay, I'm sorry, the interest rate on the bonds? Yeah. Well, the, the district will sell the bonds. Right. And that'll just be whatever the market is. Yeah. So right now, it'll probably be below 4%. But the point is, you know, when the town goes out, it's a combination of right. what is the market for bonds and what's our credit rating. Yep. Exactly. So for the Minuteman, is it a combination of what the market is and the credit ratings of all some, of them? Some towns? Is, it, is that what it is? Of yeah. I mean, they look at the district too, but my guess was with possible exception of a couple communities, you know, they're all AAA. You know, Arlington, Belmont, Lexington, Whalen, Weston, you know, Dover. Uh, we, we have one of the wealthiest unfortunate districts uh, well, my guess is it would go out as a AAA. Well, possibly. Uh, a AAA is for a general obligation bond. These would probably be more reve revenue slash general obligation. And based on what they're financing, the, the interest rate could be lower. Um, it, it, it'll be a general obligation bond. It, it, it would still be a general obligation bond. Okay. Uh, it, it's the, you know, the general obligation of the district, which means the general obligation indirectly of the towns, of its, of its members on that. Okay, are there any other questions? Meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm.